Welcome back to the program. And this is the second part of a favorite Pan-African show, Bottom Line Africa. But for now, uh, let me take that feature story that I promised you earlier by a foreign affairs editor, Lillian Odero, which has everything to do with the highlights of the just concluded technical climate change negotiations in Bonn, Germany. Here's the feature report. It is a matter at the core of every global development concept, one that is forcing governments to remodel their development indices to reflect the increasing global demand to entrench the matter in their development blueprints. Climate change and its potential threat to alter life in its current form if left unchecked. So for the next two weeks, governments sent their strongest delegations yet for another round of negotiations on climate change that would take place from the 30th of April to 10th May 2018. The agenda to further develop the guidelines for implementing the landmark 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement. This aimed to allow the agreement to become operational. The guidelines or operating manual are needed to unlock practical actions to realize the full potential of the agreement. The overarching intent of that agreement being to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and ideally 1.5 degrees Celsius. Scientists are warning of catastrophic consequences if worldwide emissions do not trend down by the year 2020. The first week of negotiations just came to an end here at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the African delegation is putting up a very strong case. Their argument is that the Africa should not pay for mistakes it did not create in the first place. And therefore, they want the developed nations to put in more funds to help the continent mitigate the effects of climate change. It is important for the African continent to be here because when you are not on the table, discussion table, others decide for you. Yes, I know Africans are very paranoid now that for the last 23 years or so or more, we've been doing these conferences and the, the farmer on the ground is not seeing any change. That is true. The, the pastoralist is not seeing any change uh, as an alpha of these conferences. But we're saying that it is important to be there, not only to expect something from, um, from there, it's a legitimate right to expect, but also to tell our own story, our own side of the story. Let the world understand that Africa is suffering from a problem they never created. That rhetoric has to remain on the table because we cannot uh, create a problem for us and then negotiate with us and, and, and tell us, uh, give us a loan to repair the problem. Uh, we, have to, we have a right to develop. That is the story we are bringing on the table, which is different. Indeed, uh, it is a, a very difficult uh, chaff of uh, negotiations. So far, there is no clarity in terms of what we definitely is going to come out of this. Uh, our partners are still talking of uh, uh, informal, formal, or non-formal issues, but the developing countries are very clear that we need a text that represents the views and the feelings and the aspirations of the developing countries. And uh, uh, in terms of reporting issues, in terms of allocation, and in terms of direct access. So what I would like to add and strongly appeal to our development partners, those who have made commitments, those who are yet to make commitments, to help us move fast into action. And remember, we are all being asked to review our NDCs and submit new ones by the year 2020, which is not very far, with slightly higher ambition or mitigation targets. So, as Pablo in his concluding remarks, five key challenges, the last one, I would like to re-appeal to development partners to help us move into action now rather than later. Have the commitment by um, developed countries to mobilize 
100 billion dollars as of 2020. So the expectation by many, many countries is that we uh, would have, hopefully this year, a clear uh, indication on how those uh, 100 billion will be coming uh, together as of 2020. Climate change financing brought together world leaders in Paris in late 2017, seeking to unlock more money to drive the global economy's shift to green energy, exactly two years after signing a global pact to avert worst-case scenario global warming. Without trillions of dollars invested in clean energy technology, the Paris Agreement's goal to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels will remain a pipe dream. We are here when the uh, uh, impacts of climate change uh, do not need to be told by scientists. You see what is happening here, there in our country, in Kenya. You have seen uh, the, 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 the floods, the way they are causing devastation in communities, in cities, and uh, many other problems. And the tragedy is when there is uh, 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 drought, you see it comes with the consequences. And when it rains, you see the consequences. The problem is our policy makers do not relate to these things. And you see all these things, we have been talking about them. The challenges of climate change in a climate-constrained world. That when it rains, it comes with the consequences you are seeing in Kenya. And when there is, a, uh, there is drought, it comes with the consequences. So this actually is a big, has big impact to our communities, to our country, and even to the people. Right now, the effects of climate change are already being felt by people across Africa. Evidence shows that the change in temperatures has affected the health, livelihoods, food productivity, water availability, and overall security of the African people. I said we cannot change our cultural practices. So how can we, you know, slowly of course they are changing, but in the meantime, how can we help our pastoralists cope? So this app has already been, has been developed and it's, it shows the farmers on their smartphones where they can migrate with their cattle you know, so that they can move in a more, more knowledgeable uh, fashion as they, as they try to look for pasture for their cattle. With 197 parties, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, has near universal membership and is the parent treaty of the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement. The UNFCCC is also the parent treaty of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, the ultimate objective of all agreements under the UNFCCC is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system in a time frame which allows ecosystems to adapt naturally and enable sustainable development. But U.S. President Donald Trump yanked the United States out of that pact. Diplomats and leaders are still wondering to what extent he will make their jobs more difficult. The, the reality and the situation right now is that the U.S. is a party to the agreement, is a party to the convention, and as such has the right to participate in, in the process. So in the, uh, from the side of the secretariat, we have to um, be the ones that give full um, full force to the rules that are uh, the basis of, of this regime and uh, of our work. So in that sense, really, there is for us no question about the participation of the uh, United States as a party and as an important partner in the process. Uh, but there's no doubt that the, the position of President Trump has affected their perception by other delegations and, and their ability to provide the kind of leadership I think the United States did working with China and others in the run-up to Paris. In terms of U.S. scientists, uh, U.S. scientists are still very engaged in this process both from home and here 
in bond, and I don't see the positions of President Trump uh, um, as affecting that at all. If, if anything, it's encouraged scientists to be more vocal and more outspoken than they were because of the, their disappointment and anger over the positions of the U.S. Uh, administration. And what we've heard from the U.S. delegation is that they intend to be involved in the negotiations, that they intend to be involved at a, at a constructive level. As to what President Trump actually means in terms of the conditions for either re-engagement or withdrawing, I think really this is a domestic matter for President Trump and, and uh, his uh, voters. But what I can say is what we see. And what we see in relation to the presidency is a willingness to engage, and we welcome that, and a willingness to have con constructive engagement, and we welcome that. Organizers of the Global Climate Action Summit taking place this September in San Francisco provided new evidence of how cities, states, regions, businesses, and investors are taking climate ambition to the next level. In this way, they are helping to build momentum for a successful outcome for the UN Climate Change Conference in Poland at the end of the year. Say 2018 has been declared the year of climate litigation, and this is why. The courts have become the front line in the war against climate change. I'm about to walk in here at the Nairobi Room, where the Climate Litigation Network is having a media briefing. Come in with me and let's listen in. In December 2015, the Commission of Human Rights of the Philippines launched, launched an investigation into the responsibility of carbon producers, such as Shell and Total, for human rights harms resulting from climate change. <laughs> this year, there will be hearings and consultations in the Philippines, U.S., and Europe. Political leaders, be unnoticed. If you do not live up to the obligations to protect human rights, and prevent dangerous climate change and prepare for the, for the current and future impacts, communities from all over the world will take you to court. In Without advances in the talks over the commitment of future financial support from rich countries to developing nations who are already facing devastating climate impacts, it became difficult for other areas of the negotiations to progress. The negotiators are sort of negotiating with one hand tied behind their back because they're seen as not fully in. That being said, my sense is they're trying to do what they can on issues where there is not a shift uh, in U.S. position from previous administrations, particularly on the robust rule book and transparency guidelines. Uh, the United States and China are co-facilitating the, uh, the transparency uh, working group. Um, the show can corroborate this, but everything I've heard from negotiators is they're doing a very good job working together. We are really talking about and trying to finalize all the detailed rules, rules of the Paris Agreement. So that's a daunting task. And it is, you know, at the end of the day, up to the Polish presidency to bring all these various pieces that are scattered across the different subsidiary bodies together. So that's, that's a very big task, and they have a very heavy responsibility on their shoulder. The second key area is, is, is developed countries giving signals that are going to build confidence that climate finance is increasing. And I'd point to two kind of main ways that developed countries could do, do that between now and COP24. One is that in October, donors have to provide uh, these reports. They have to provide information on the provision of their climate finance over the coming years, known as future strategies and approaches. Um, a lot of these reports in the past have been pretty weak. They haven't given too much information on what they're going to provide. Um, but they are an opportunity for, for donors to really show uh, that they're committed to increasing their climate finance at a steady pace, that they're committing to increasing grant-based support, adaptation support, support to LDCs, all areas which are neglected and would help build confidence if they're addressed. The negotiators are now looking at another preparatory session before COP24 to make progress on a number of technical issues. The sessions will be held in Bangkok, Thailand in September. Kenya has benefited from this negotiation because nationally we are ahead in terms of uh, policy and local instruments. For Kenya we have developed a climate change policy as well as a climate change act. The most important thing in all institutions is don't be 
too picky about the wordings that have been um, disagreed, agreed, uh, converged, diverged, but rather what can we access as an institution, you know, Foreign Affairs, Mukai, their parliament here, and, uh, and all of you, different institutions, what can we take home and how, what kind of cooperation and partnership can we build with the various actors who are here. The Bangkok meeting will then forward texts and draft decisions for adoption to the annual session of the Conference of Parties COP24, taking place in Poland in December. Lilian Odera, KTN News. And of course, that report by Lilian Odera brings us to the end of our program tonight. Many thanks for watching. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim, but now I'll leave you with our proverb of the day. Bye-bye and enjoy the rest of your night.